Okay, folks. Hello. Welcome back to class. This is a, I hope, pretty short lecture about uh, Git and how it works. Uh, you don't necessarily need to understand everything that I say here. Um, as we progress, things will get a little bit more technical. And what I want you to do is kind of do your best to make sense of stuff and uh, try to understand how it will apply to our workflow. So here I'll be explaining uh, what Git is and what the processes in general are for working with Git. And in another video, actually already in the VS Code videos that exist that you may be able to see, um, I will explain uh, how to work with Git from within your text editor. Okay, so let's get started on some Git concepts. So what we're going to talk about today is collaboration and some uh, Git terminology, remotes, branches, commits, the work tree, and the repository. All right, here we go. So Git is a uh, is a system that is uh, designed for uh, massive collaboration. It was built to work with the Linux kernel, which is the biggest open source software project in history. Um, uh, it there was version control software before Git, but Git has this amazing thing that it's really easy to collaborate, uh, even on a massive scale, with Git. Uh, so it's a semi, it's like a pretty distributed system, although we tend to think of uh, uh, the system as having uh, kind of a center, of a, an origin repository. Um, so the first thing we need to understand is the concept of a remote. Um, so a remote is, uh, to some extent, a, um, a kind of situational concept. Um, <clears throat> I have a local repository uh, that is my local repository because, only because it is on my laptop. Every other copy of the repository that exists is, from my perspective, a remote. It's something to which I relate as a remote. Uh, so, uh, you know, if I'm Alice in purple over here, uh, I have my repo, and then I could be attached to as many remotes as I want, perhaps the kind of central repository that's on, say, GitHub or some other website. Um, and I could also be attached to my friend John's repo in green over there. Uh, and John could be a remote for me, and, and we might sometimes communicate just among ourselves or between ourselves uh, and only occasionally talk to the remote. That's a perfectly normal way to work. Um, we can think about this a little bit in terms of our class. So, like, if we had a physical class, which we often do, I would come to that class with my laptop. I have a copy of a repository on my laptop, and if you know, when I start work, all I do is have some interaction between myself and a repository on GitHub. We call that relationship a cloning relationship in which the, uh, the repository that I have at home can be cloned to GitHub or I can clone the repository from GitHub. Um, when other people start to work with me, we have more complex, net, what we might call network topology. You can see these relationships are a little bit more complicated. So we have the laptop and my GitHub uh, repos. But then after that, y'all might want to fork my repository. What that's going to mean on GitHub is that you take my existing copy of the code and you make a, a new image of that um, of that code on GitHub itself. So then we have one copy on GitHub that belongs to me, one that belongs to Alice, one that belongs to Bob, and one that belongs to say call uh, And so those are that action on GitHub is called forking, and y'all have already done it if you've worked with history, please. Um, and then this is something you ha we haven't done yet in class. Uh, if you want to um, to work with that uh, stuff on um, at home on your own laptops, 
you will take your fork repository and clone them to your laptops. And so we now see that there's a lot of intermediates between my laptop and your laptop. Um, so uh, <clears throat> you have a copy on GitHub, I have a copy on GitHub, Kalsang has a copy on GitHub. If, say, Alice and Kalsang want to talk to each other, they will talk to each other through a kind of long, um, complicated path that takes them often, usually, through my repository also. Okay, feel free to pause this at any time and just take a look at these diagrams and make sure you understand them. So, <clears throat> there are many copies of the repository and the repository uh, and each of those copies can be synced in complicated ways. Within the repository, within a given repository, there is further complexity. So in general, a Git repository contains multiple branches. Uh, and uh, usually, I mean, there are different ways of working with uh, a Git repository. But usually what happens is we have one branch, which is called in this kind of obscene way, master, the master branch. Uh, and every time we want to make improvements to the piece of software, we will create a fork for that particular improvement. And um, often, if it's a bigger sh uh, software project, many people are working on different improvements at, at the same time. So when they start, they will uh, branch from the main branch, usually called the master branch or sometimes the develop branch, uh, and work away. And they'll keep working until they're done. Uh, <clears throat> and so we see here in this image um, a little feature and a bigger feature being worked on at the same time. They were started at different moments in time, and right now none of them are finished, so they're all being uh, worked on at the same time. When we look at this, we can see that the history of the repository is not a straight line, but a tree, as we discussed earlier. <clears throat> In principle, as long as you work properly with Git and are always committing your changes, nothing is ever lost. So you can make all these changes in this complicated way and can always get back and see what you were doing. It's pretty cool. It, it's pretty cool, but it can sometimes be a little bit hard. It's easy to get lost, before, especially when you're not yet really familiar with Git. It took me, I'd say, a year or two to really feel like I had had sort of some mastery of the Git system. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so um, we have here like a, just a slightly more um, realistic, a tiny, moderately realistic notion that, say, <clears throat> I have a project in green here. I develop it on my laptop. I, I send it to GitHub and make it available to people. Alice um, forks is interested in the project and interested in contributing to the project. She makes a fork on GitHub. She clones it to her laptop, makes some changes, creates a new branch, and submits a pull request on the GitHub website, which I can then review and potentially merge into my code. All right. So now to talk about some of the words that we have um, that I've already used, but maybe without explaining fully. Um, when you are working in a Git repository, changes are not automatically saved to the repository. In order to make Git aware of your changes, you have to manually perform a commit action, and you have seen this on the GitHub website when you were working on uh, on the History Please project. Um, so a commit has a commit message, and it also has a hash that identifies it. And you can see here in purple the hash, the short hash is A1E8FB5. Uh, there's a short and a long hash for every commit. Every commit that is ever made to the Git repository can always be revisited later. So if I'm at the master, uh, um, you know, if, I, if I've made several commits and I'm like, oh, wait, what, what was it like before I did the last couple of things? I can go back from that point that right now says master. I can go back and check out, we call it, A1E8FB5 and see the state of the code then. Um, in fact, 
a branch, which is the thing that we normally work with, is not an especially real thing, and it's just what we call a pointer to a specific commit. And we will see a little bit how that works towards the end of this mini lecture. You don't necessarily have to understand everything that I say there. Uh, yeah, um, that's maybe not that important. Neither is that. Um, <clears throat> so let's. So so the commits that we've learned so far, uh, the concepts we've been introduced to so far are, I think, uh, uh, remote branch commit. And now I want to just delve a little bit further into the internals of Git uh, and talk about the work tree and the repository. In Git, there's this really important distinction between what you see and what underlies the Git system. I often think of this in terms of Platonism, in terms of the, you know, the, um, the idea that there's a world of appearances and a true world that underlies that world of appearances. In Git, the files that you work with are, as it were, mere appearances, and underneath those files are the real objects that Git understands. Uh, so what you see, say, like here's a copy of the History Please uh, repository, are a bunch of files and folders. But Git constructs those files and folders for you out of a large number of objects that live inside the usually invisible uh, directory which is dot git period git, which you can always see in your um, in your file if you uh, if you make hidden files visible. Um, and they have so you'll you'll find in the dot git uh, folder an objects folder, and then a whole bunch of uh, two letter uh, or two digit um, directories, um, each of which contains one or more bizarre uh, files. You should, if you want, check these out and see what they look like on your computer. Be really, really, really careful not to change anything, because if you change anything, you could screw up your whole uh, repository irrevocably. So just be super careful. Um, so this is what you see and what's underneath. I said earlier that uh, a branch is not as thing-like as we imagine it, but instead it's just what we call a pointer to a particular commit. And here we can see again inside the .git uh, folder, there you'll find a folder called refs and a folder inside that called heads, and inside that you'll have at least one um, a, a file called master. And you'll also have another file for every uh, every existing branch in your repository. So here's a repository that has four branches. And if you were to look at that file, you would find that it was, uh, in this case, 41 bytes in general, 41 bytes. I, I forget exactly how many characters that is. And all it is is what's called a hash, just a unique identifier. Uh, for the uh, that points to one of those files that we saw inside the objects folder. So it's just an identifier for one of the objects. Uh, and um, if you go to one of those objects, you'll see something like this, which is <coughs> a uh, it, it's just a hexadecimal uh, representation of the changes that have been made sequentially to the um, uh, to the repository. So every com so so what happens in Git is that you start out, you create a bunch of files, then you commit those all to Git, and Git doesn't does a, a kind of magic with them, uh, compressing them and converting them into a um, into an, a kind of pseudo-encrypted format. 
in order to uh, make them manageable and unique. Uh, and then every time you make a change to your repository, that change is uh, is recorded in Git as what's called a diff on top of the previous commit. So <clears throat> the each commit is a relationship to the commits that came before us. This is why I say here that Git is a database. It's a very clever way of tracking relationships between actions that have been taking, taken in the repository. Uh, and it's this underlying database structure that, uh, that makes Git so fundamentally powerful. You don't have to know this in order to work with Git, but it's a little bit useful to start thinking about what it is that you're actually working with. And that's the kind of thing that we try to do a lot of in this class. All right. So now you've got some basic ideas of Git, like working concepts and what is inside a Git repository. Let's talk about how we might actually work in Git. Um, so um, we talked already about the existence of branches. The thing is that if you work on uh, a project and get on, a, on an improvement to the software, eventually you want it to be made available to everybody else. So usually what you're going to do is take your changes and merge them into the main branch of the repository. We see this happening here. Uh, <clears throat> we start out at a common base in blue. Master continues, it's got a bunch, you know, you're making a bunch of changes to master. Meanwhile, you're working on another feature in green. So stuff has been changed in the master branch. You've been making changes in the feature. And in order to, uh, to make your new feature available to, the, um, to everybody else, you're going to have to incorporate those changes into, um, into the master branch. And we do that through the merge action. Uh, uh, the changes from the feature are brought over into the master. And um, a new commit is made, and uh, it brings the two branches together. That is awesome, except, you know, what sucks is that potentially someone could have made changes in master. Meanwhile, you're not paying attention, and you work on the same exact files or even the same lines, and potentially there's a conflict between the, uh, the changes that are made in the two branches. And when you try to merge, Git's not sure what to do. Uh, we call this, as I say, a merge conflict. They can really suck. But in this case, as we can see here, they're not in principle impossible to resolve. And GitHub and VS Code both have tools that allow you to inspect merge conflicts and to resolve them manually. So you have to decide here, do you want cat or dog uh, uh, but in general, you really want to try to avoid uh, merge conflicts, and you ought to be able to do that in your own repositories because you're the only one working on them. Uh, and they, the conflicts only arise in general if I screw something up and then I have to try to push changes to your repositories, and that can kind of suck, but hopefully it won't happen. Okay. Um, Make sure you understood what I just said. Now, um, let's look at pushing and pulling, which are like uh, uh, additional steps on top of merging. They're, they're tools that are built on top of the merge principle. So suppose we start out, um, the, uh, the repository has, the, the repository on GitHub has two commits, an initial commit and something else that's been done in blue. So initial commit in yellow. Uh, I um, clone or pull the uh, the remote, the origin repository to my laptop. We'll call it the local fork, or the local, yeah, the local fork. Um, <clears throat> and right now, the repositories are actually identical. So there's no difference between um, 
my laptop repo and the um, and the one on the web. But then I start working, and you can see slowly my uh, repository begins to diverge from the remote repository. So instead of just two commits, I now have four commits. And then I want I need to push my changes back to GitHub or to the remote. And after I've successfully done that, the repos, the two repositories are identical again. And you and both of them are at the uh, commit number four. Or, so they both both branches point to the same commit. That's when you're, so this shows you what you, what happens when you're working on your own. Um, when you're working together with other people, things can become much more complicated. Um, and we can have various other kinds of workflows. Maybe I won't even talk too much about these little diagrams, but you can inspect them yourself and see if you understand them. When you push or pull, depending on your relationship, either you're pulling in changes from someone else or you're pushing changes to the, um, to the central repository, what ha what's happening is that you are asking to impose changes from one branch in one copy of the repository to another branch in another copy of the repository. The first thing that happens in this process is that uh, get adds the commit objects, those pieces of the database, from the pushing repository into the pulling repository. So those objects will be transferred, you know, over the internet. The next thing it does is it tries to update the pointer that's at the tip of the branch of the receiving or pulling repository. If it succeeds, fantastic. If not, there's a conflict and you resolve the conflict and then create a new commit and then uh, undertake the merge. Uh, and um, so those are, that's some of the vocabulary around Git uh, and as you work with Git it will become less mysterious. You're going to be like kind of, uh, you know, stumbling around in the dark a little bit at when we start off the class and as you start out working with Git. But as you get more experienced, all of these words will become kind of familiar technical terms and you'll become more and more comfortable and you'll start to see that Git, instead of something to fear and hate, is really a tool to love. And I, that's uh, one of my aims for the class is just to get you to that point. Okay, then. Awesome. Uh, I will be seeing you soon, and there will be more videos to come up.